Hi everybody, this week we're looking at digital literacy. So understanding um, being literate in using digital technologies is essentially what digital literacy is about. It's composed of different things, things like the network literacy that we looked at previously, as well as information literacy and web literacy. So all of those ways that we understand how to communicate using these digital tools, that's what we're going to talk about in terms of digital literacy. So think about this. Do we really need to know everything anymore? How many of you, when you were at school, had to memorise something that you've never ever needed to use again? Not a good use of your time and probably not a good use of the teacher's time either. But school, school was different then perhaps and we, we were more focused on the memorisation of facts. But we don't need to be anymore because Google memorises the facts for us. So we can, if we need to, find out pretty much anything using Mr Google. He's our friend in that area. That's because we live in an information age where information is available, accessible and easy to, for us to locate in some ways. And I think there's a lot to be said for not teaching specific facts to students that they might not ever need to use again when they can easily find them using Google. And that's one of the benefits to them having uh, digital devices in the classroom that they can use those to look up a fact if they need it. And certainly I think we do that too as adults. We, if we need to know something, we look it up on Google or YouTube or one of those places. However, one thing that our students do need to know is how to sort through that information that's out there. How to sort the wheat from the chaff. How to find what's good information and how to sort out the stuff that's really not good or useful information for them. They're the kind of skills that we need to be developing in our students as we are um, facilitating their learning. So we've looked at network literacy already. Today we're going to look at information literacy and web literacy. So the concept of in information literacy has been around for a long time. Uh, we've been learning it every time we go to a library class at school. Hopefully if we had a good teacher librarian they taught us about the information literacy process. The steps around defining, locating, selecting, organising, presenting and evaluating the information that's available. I believe that this, this kind of literacy is much more important now than it's ever been because students need to understand what's good information and what's not. So as teachers, we need to be teaching them things like how to ask the right questions. What is it that they actually really need to know to be able to answer the question that they're trying to solve or um, you know, solve the problem that they're trying to solve? We need to help them with those defined skills. We need the, to help them and give them skills in terms of locating the right information. Is it the right information? Is it relevant to their purposes? And we'll look at this aspect in a moment too. We need to help them find ways to organise their information using digital tools like Dropbox or Google Docs or things like that, Google Drive, or using paper-based tools and being able to select when is the right time to use one or the other. We need to give them different ways to present the information that they've found. Again, from digital ways, right through to the traditional pen and paper or spoken word formats, creative formats. And most importantly, we need to be able to teach them how to evaluate and assess the information that they're seeing out there in the world. So this is a, information literacy is a very important part of digital literacy because ICT has meant that information is more and more delivered in different digital formats. So the first thing that we are going to look at today is about um, how to understand what is the right kind of information. And there's a neat little tool that you can use for yourselves and also to teach to your students. Interesting acronym, but it's called the CRAP test. So pardon the language, but it's a good way of remembering using these acronyms. So there are five elements to the, the CRAP test, or we could call it the CRAP test if we needed to. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So digital literacy is about people being savvy users of ICT resources and the information that's available out there. It's about understanding that anyone can publish to the internet 
And while there's a lot of good stuff out there, there's also a lot of, if you'll pardon me saying, crap. So we need to look at a whole lot of things when we're looking for information on the web, again, as both adults and with our students, we need to answer, ask these types of questions. So around currency, we need to ask, how recent is this information? Was it published recently or was it published a long time ago? If it's something like technology, it's very important that the information is uh, new and um, recent because, you know, anything 10 or more years ago is probably going to be out of date in terms of technology. Other things we can trust that the information, if the information's a little bit older, but for the most part we need to think about when was this actually published and find that information on the web page in some form. Then we need to look at the relevance of the information that we're, we're discovering. Does it actually fit the needs? Does it answer the questions that we're trying to solve? Does it help us to solve our problems? Is it relevant to the location that we're in? Our education system is very different to the American system or the UK system or the Chinese system. So we need to um, understand that the information that we might get about education from those places is very different. Does it answer our question in a uh, Northern Hemisphere context rather than the Southern Hemisphere context? If our students are looking up information about the changing seasons and um, a website is talking about having winter in summer, then that's not relevant to, uh, sorry, winter in December, that's not relevant to their Australian context. And then is the, um, the information relevant to the age group? Is it presented in a way that they'll actually be able to understand? It's important for us to understand that. What's the authority of the information that's presented? What are the author's credentials? Do they have the right to be giving information about this? Have they um, disclosed their sources? Who has actually published or created the material? And is it someone that's reputable? Or is it somebody that really doesn't have the right to be speaking about this in any authority sense? We need to investigate that as well. We need to investigate the accuracy. Where did the author get the information that they've presented in the web context? Is it um, taken from a, a source and is the source named? Um, can you check the accuracy by checking other sources? Uh, again, another very important skill for students to be able to have is for them to understand that they need to check more than one source when taking information from, or from anywhere, but uh, definitely from the web. Is it presented in a quality way? Are there spelling mistakes, grammatical mistakes, typing mistakes? Those things can really um, make a difference to whether we understand the accuracy of it or not, or, or even if we can believe the authority of a source. If it's not presented in a way that um, shows professionalism, then it's probably something that we need to bypass and find a different source. Is there any evidence of bias or emotion present in the, in the context? Students need to understand how to sift through that as well and, and to be able to push aside things that are biased towards a certain point of view. And this comes back to the purpose as well. You know, a lot of people publish um, information to the internet that has a um, ulterior motive. They have a purpose behind what they're posting and you know, it, they're very interested in getting their point across. So who has published the information and why? What is their purpose for putting this information? Is it to sell a product? Is it just to provide information? Is it to provoke a response? Students need to be able to ask these questions. Is there advertising on the um, website? And is it clearly labelled? Or is the whole website an advertisement? All of these things are really important for students to understand. And really, they're important for us as teachers to understand too. So we're going to have a look at some examples of you know, how we can be fooled by information that's on the web. So this first uh, example is from a website called dhmo.org. So have a look at this. This is one of the pages here from this website. What are some of the dangers associated with DHMO? And it talks about things like death due to accidental inhalation, even in small quantities, you know, uh, prolonged exposure to solid DHMO caused severe t tissue damage. It's given to vicious dogs in, uh, involved in recent attacks. Now, for those of you who have some understanding of science, you'll understand that dihydrogen monoxide is just another way of saying water. 
But if you didn't have that knowledge, or you didn't understand how to sift through that knowledge, you could be probably quite alarmed by this. We actually used this quite a few years ago in our primary school classroom um, to help our students understand this concept of, you know, people can use the internet to fool people. And people have been taken in by this particular website. If you, if you search for this uh, website online you'll find some interesting stories about people that have been taken in by this information, written very emotional letters about it, um, ha wanting to have it banned, all of that kind of thing. So it's amazing who can be taken in um, by some something that looks maybe a little bit authoritative. But there are some clues to this. If you look at this website there are some clues about why it might not be right. Now this this website particularly was designed by a scientist to um, you know, promote digital literacy, to promote the understanding that, you know, there are a lot of people out there on the web that can provide false information. So it's, it's, um, it's got a good uh, intent behind it. So, but there are clues here that tell us that this is not an authoritative scientific website. And this is what we need to teach our students to look for. So things like understanding web addresses and particularly the suffix on a web address. If, it, if a web address ends in edu, that generally means that it's some kind of educational organisation. So edu, just on its own, is usually the US, edu.au, of course, is Australia, and so on. So usually, and not always, but usually we can assume that the information that we get from a web that address that includes an edu suffix is going to be pretty okay. This one is a .org address. Which, which is a little less safe. What that means is um, a dot .org address can be bought by pretty much anybody. It, they don't have to prove their worth in terms of content or intent. Um, anybody can purchase a dot .org domain. The suffix is another word for the domain. So anything with a dot .org or even a dot .net address can be uh, you need to look at that with a little bit of suspicion in some cases. You know, there are very reputable um, websites that use these domains, but there are also lots of unreputable websites that use these domains as well. So it's important to understand the different ways that this information can be shared. A .gov address, domain, .gov or .gov.au, is generally a government organisation. And sometimes, depending on the government, you can trust that information as well. Of course, .com is a commercial website and anybody can buy a .com. So even just understanding how the URL of a website works will help you to determine whether you can start to trust this information or whether you need to explore further. The structure of this page is not very professional looking. It's lots of different colours. It looks like old school web um, design. And so that might give us some clues. Does it look professional? that goes back to the uh, relevance of it and um, it doesn't look, or the accuracy of it, it doesn't look like a professional scientific based website so that might give us a clue as well. There's also some clues in the advertising. The advertisement on this page is for a South Park product. Um, now obviously a reputable scientific publication probably wouldn't be advertising South Park merchandise. So that gives us another clue as well. So it's about, about being able to look at the sources that we're using for our information and determining whether they're good or, or not so good. It's also about being able to sift through the answers that we find on the internet and understanding sources. So there are two types of t sources. There are primary sources and there are secondary sources. A primary source is basically something that has come first hand from someone. Someone that experienced it or researched it or understood it in, in great detail. Whereas a secondary source will take that primary source and adapt it or build upon it or change it in some way. So it's important that we understand um, what are primary sources and what are secondary sources, but it's also very important that we understand that we need to check more than one source. And that's something that we all need to do more carefully. If something tells us something, we don't take that as gospel. We need to make sure that we've checked at least two or three sources if we're using an internet-based um, information. So look at this one, for example. This website is an ex about explorers website. Have a look at this first sentence here. Christopher Columbus was born in 1951 in Sydney, Australia. 
Okay, well, most of us would go, that's not right. But a habit that a lot of school children have is just to take the first piece of information that they find and copy and paste it into their PowerPoint or their poster or whatever. So it's really important that we learn to read through the information, check it against other sources and verify it. If you look further down here, it says at the top he was born in 1951, but towards the bottom it says he returned to Spain in 1939. So he actually returned to Spain before he was born. Now any savvy user of information would be able to work that out by reading it and thinking carefully about the information that they've found. So it's really important that we don't take the first piece of information that we see and use it, that we think about all of those things. Is it current? Is it relevant? Is it accurate? Very important skill for students to be able to have. And that brings me to Wikipedia. A lot of people uh, don't think that Wikipedia is a good source. I happen to think it's an excellent source of information. There is content on Wikipedia from a whole lot of different sources and in some cases it's variable but in most cases it's, it's extremely accurate and there's been research done that says it's accurate in most cases um, more accurate than um, sources like the Encyclopedia Britannica and that's because an encyclopedia needs to be constantly peer-reviewed, republished, all of that sort of thing, whereas the, um, the nature of a wiki or the internet means that anyone can edit it at any time and keep it up to date and accurate as that information comes to hand. And so a lot of people say, well, Wikipedia is a wiki and a, the nature of a wiki we'll look at later, but a wiki means that anyone can edit it at any time. But what they have found through their research is that because there are lots of different people editing the, the content on Wikipedia, they jump on it pretty quickly. If somebody goes and changes something, um, the people that are passionate about that information being accurate will change it very, very quickly. Of course, we always check another source. It's important as teachers, as learners, and for our students as well, that we don't just take the things that are written in Wikipedia as gospel, but it can be a very good way to start our um, search for information. Um, and we can guarantee its um, accuracy in most cases. So it's usually the first place I go for information about any topic. And then I go and find some other sources to back up that information. It's also a really good way to teach about how online content can be created. So because anybody can edit a Wikipedia article, if we get our students to do that, they start to get a real sense through doing how this stuff works. So many years ago in my class, we, um, we actually edited the, um, the entry for Corwell. I was at Corwell Primary School. We edited the entry for Corwell in Wikipedia. So the students got to, to experience firsthand what it was like to contribute to Wikipedia. And that helps them to understand the notion that there is always somebody out there creating this content online. So it's a very valuable source, I think, um, for us as teachers, for us as learners, but also for our students. Um, yeah, good, good one to use. And then we also need to know how Google works. Now, there's a lot of text on here. Um, you, can get, you can see some videos about this through it via the Mahara or my YouTube playlist, the Learning with Technology playlist. I'll put a link for that on the page. But it's important to know how Google works. The web is made up of more than 60 trillion web pages. It's, it's hard to even comprehend a number like that, but there are that many pages out there. So when Google goes looking for information, it goes through all of those pages and it indexes them. And when you do a search, it will search those indexes to find the most relevant responses to the searches that you do. And then they are then ranked. So the pages that Google throws up for you in a search are ranked according to more than 200 things, including things like your user preferences, the pages that you search frequently, safe search, the location of a page or the location that you're in. So it will give you Australian based results over uh, Chinese results, the language that you speak, um, that you're using. It will give you searches related to that, results related to that. It'll give you results related to the freshness of the content, the page size, the quality. So it ranks them. So you do hopefully end up with the, the best results at the top of your list. The personalised search feature of Google means you get results based on previous searches and that uses the cookies on your computer and there's more information about that on YouTube as well. So if you understand how Google works, it's a good idea to learn some tricks about how to use, how to use those searches effectively on the webs. 
So I've li listed a few here, but there are also videos that you can watch about that. But it's about understanding that you can limit the search results by using things like quotation marks to get exact matches for your text, or using the minus sign to take out words that aren't relevant to what you're looking for. And understanding this will give you so much power in terms of searching for information. And it will also give your students power in terms of searching for information. So what all of this points to is that we can all be savvy users of the internet by understanding how it works, it makes us better users of the, the content that's out there. And that's what digi digital literacy is all about. It's being able to harness the technology that's available there t to find better ways to communicate with the world. Thanks again for watching.